Uh, my name is Mike. If I have not had a chance to meet you, I know this is, this is one of the um, great times of year. Uh, fall, um, as much as I um, grieve summer being behind me, um, it'll still feel like summer for a couple more months, so don't, don't fret there. Um, but I love this idea, and I get kind of nostalgic. I can't tell. So we had our first uh, grandkid over the summer, which was amazing. Uh, she's two months old, and so I find myself kind of nostalgic and a little weepy uh, in a lot of ways that I are sort of uh, unexpected. So this is really exciting uh, to be kind of launch into this fall we're going to talk about today. And my task is really simple. My task is to tell you or to share with you who we are and or what we do and why we do what we do. That's what I'll, what we do and why we do what we do. I know I have a lot of folks who are coming back into town from our return to college, a lot of uh, incoming freshmen who come in, their parents are here, a lot of times they're here with them and you're trying to hope that your kids get connected or all the emotions that go along with this. And so I, I get all of that. And um, it is an, it's an absolute honor to be able to be here with you today. A little context. Um, our church uh, is 23 years old. We'd be 23 years old in October. Uh, I was here in the beginning uh, it was not always like this. In fact, when it first started, there were literally just a handful of people. Uh, we could count about 24, and most of them were high school kids. And when we first had our services, we were in an auditorium only because the auditorium was cheap. Uh, and we, could have, we, we uh, uh, had, had it seated about 720 people, had a big giant curtain uh, in the front of the stage. And we started a service at 10 o'clock. And we, we were supposed to start our services at 10 o'clock. We really never did because we would stand behind the curtain There'd be nobody there at 10 o'clock. You're just kind of waiting. And like when five or six or nine people would trickle in, then you'd start your service and the other you know, 25 or 30 or 40 would show up. And so they're scattered all over this, this big auditorium. So we remember what all those days were like. Um, we will walk in here today. We have a campus in Leland and a campus in New Bern. And you walk into our buildings and our spaces and there's programs, and there's volunteers and you know, there are people who look like they know what they're doing and, and most, most of them, uh, they do, right? Most of them do. Um, but what's easy to believe is when you walk in here that you can easily think that this is just sort of the result of a well-executed strategic plan. Um, but let me assure you, that is not what you're walking into. Um, no one is surprised, more surprised what this has become than me because I know me. And so as you are entering into this, I want to remind you that what you're walking into is the result of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of really small acts of faith. A few were really big. Some of those steps of faith were very obvious and they were thrilling Others of those steps of faith were gut-wrenching and they were hard. And there were times when I felt like I was gonna die. And that's not, I mean, like really thought I was gonna die. And all this has sort of become, and so I stand here today, 23 years in, kind of welcoming, you know, the fall in, getting to talk about what we do and why we do it. Um, there's a little bit of uh, sort of zip in what I feel, a little, little fire in what I'm feeling about this because it matters so much. It matters to to what happens in your life and what happens in my life. And it happens, uh, it matters because of what we become, what happens in our church and through our church. And so I've thought about this and every time this year, I start thinking about 23, I go read my journals and look back 23 years ago. And I remember, you know, I was never the kind of guy who came and said, oh, God's giving me this vision and we're gonna go take this hill. It was more like, I think this is what God's doing. I'm not really sure about it. I need all the help I can get. And we just sort of built our team that way. And I'm very fortunate to have had been surrounded by a couple of people who believed in me more than I believed in myself. I don't know if you've ever needed that before. We didn't know what we were doing. We were trying to figure this out. And we had some people who just sort of came alongside us in the right place. But one thing is crystal clear. It was crystal clear 23 years ago and it's crystal clear today. And it is the mission of Port City Community Church. And our mission is simply this, to reach people and to help them walk with God. That's what we've been trying to do for 23 years, to reach people and to help them walk with God. We're not trying to do anything more than that. And we're certainly not trying to do anything less than that. We believe that out of that, everything else becomes what God intends to reach people and to help them walk with God. I was writing about this and I thought I still believe this more. Uh, I still believe this as much today as I did 
23 years ago, but that's actually not true. I actually believe it more today than I did 23 years ago. So every statement, every word, and I see you can put that statement back up there too, to reach people and help them walk with God. Every statement, every word in that statement matters. It's intentional and it matters. And we're gonna focus on just a couple of them today, to reach and to help. And of course, walk is important because that's what this is ultimately about. The reason, and I'll go ahead and tell you, the reason I love walk, if you stop and think about it, the fact that human beings can walk, like bipedal locomotion is actually pretty miraculous. Think about this. We're like six feet tall and not that wide. And we sort of, we don't fall. Like if you stand a two by four, like that just falls over. Like the fact that we can like stand up is kind of miraculous. If you ever watched like kids learn to walk, it's literally, you just, you, you, you can't believe it. They just are crawling along one day and they prop themselves up on something, right? They grab onto it and they do the wobble. They're like, whoa, what is all this? And everything's trying to find this center of gravity. And then eventually, you know, you get them all these little tra- contraptions and toys and they scooch across things. But what inevitably happens when a kid's learning to walk, someone, an adult, their parent, goes over and reaches into them and holds their fingers out. And they grab on their fingers and they start to walk. And eventually the kids kind of wobble and get some one step and then another and you let go of their fingers and they take a couple more and they fall. inevitably they fall. And as a parent, you don't go, you're a terrible walker. <laughs> what do you do? You like reach your hands down, get their fingers and you pick them back up and you help them take some more steps. And this is exactly what we aim to do in our mission. A lot of folks, they come into the church and they make these promises. God, I'm gonna commit myself to you and I'm gonna be faithful to you forever. And then they take a couple of steps and fall. And everybody comes along and says, you're a terrible follower of Jesus. You're, you have terrible faith or you feel that about yourself. And instead, it's just a part of the process of learning to walk. You're never gonna commit one Sunday and then do it perfectly for the rest of your life. You're always gonna be learning and growing and you're gonna need people to extend their hands to you and to help you take a step sometimes when you can barely even get yourself up or when you can't get up. And sometimes when your faith is sort of shaken, you need someone to actually have faith for you until you can sort of get back on the foundation and find your faith again. And we just believe it's really important for us to be that kind of people for one another. So that's walk. The reason I love the idea of help and this has always been our posture. I remember I was sitting in a coffee shop in 1999 trying to dream about this church that would be one day. I saw these people coming in and they were like family sitting down having coffee. And then there was a you know, mom coming in with her kids and getting ready for preschool. And then there was a guy coming in, looks like he was going to work in an office. And maybe a guy who was coming in to work somewhere else. And then all these different people walking in. And you know, I just began to kind of let myself, my imagination go and try to, uh, try to just, tell a story about each person and just sort of dream and consider what they were thinking, what they were going through, what they were struggling with. I'm 28 years old, so I don't, I don't know much. I'm just trying to think of this the best I can. And so I began to look and I remember thinking, man, there are people, maybe somebody's hanging by a thread. Maybe, in their, maybe it's in their marriage or a relationship's important to them. Maybe it's with their kids. Maybe something's come unglued at work or in their finances, or maybe they're dealing with the stress in ways that are uh, not healthy, maybe indulging in things, maybe there's addiction issues, or maybe there's this, and it just began to kind of create all these things that the world sort of would, would throw our way. And I thought, I wonder if we could be a place that could just help, that could just help, just extend ourselves just enough to help, not solve or fix, but to help. Over the years, this has become really important because people always want to argue with me about what I believe about certain things. And I just don't do that. The thing about being helpful is you don't have to try and convince people that you're right and they're wrong. You just have to say, how can I be helpful? Lord knows that's a novel idea, right? When people start to talk, just how can I help you? How can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I make myself available to you? I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm not going to argue, how can I help? It just allows us as a whole church and strategy and structure to just say, how can we be helpful to the world around us? So I want to give you a couple of statements, a couple of words, and then talk about why reach matters more than we can imagine it does and why it matters to me and to us today more today than it did 23 years ago. So a couple of observations if you're new to Port City and kind of coming in wanting to know what, is, what do we believe? What does Mike believe? Obviously, I say what obviously. Um, we do believe, and we did a whole series talking about the Bible. Um, it reveals to us God's love for us. It reveals God's character. It reveals God's pursuit of us. 
It reveals to us as we read and participate and we soak and we talk and we study and we teach. It, God reveals himself. This isn't about us trying to find out the right answer to the right problem or the right strategy to the right solution and execute on it. It's us to know who he is and how he is. That's how we use it. But we believe that you have been made by God and that you have been made for God. Every human being has been made by God and made for God, every one. When you talk to me and you say, I'm an atheist or I'm this, I'm like, okay, that's fine. But in my, in my mind, I'm going, I know you've been made by God and I know you've been made for God. So I'm never working against what you already want. We are never working against what you have actually been made for. If we move in this direction, we help people walk towards this kind of relationship. And the second thing is, everybody believes something. A lot of people try to tell me, I don't believe anything. You believe something. Everybody believes something. You have beliefs about God. You have beliefs about spiritual matters. You have belief about education. You have beliefs about vocation. You have belief about sex, belief about marriage, belief about, you have beliefs about all kinds of things. And what you believe, what you believe will determine how you participate in the world around you. And so our, our, our aim is to work together to make sure those, those beliefs, those, found, those, those things that we see rest on a foundation that can actually support the weight of human desire and human longing. And what you put your life on, what you build your life on will determine how secure and how stable you experience the world around us. We believe that foundation is Jesus Christ and that's what we um, push towards. So that's a couple of things. I can't wait to actually get into the message, right? Um, a couple of things I want you to consider. I want you to consider number one is the idea of rightness. Rightness. What would it be like for your life to be right, for the world to be right, for your relationships to be right? I don't mean correct. I mean to go, this is what I wanted. What would it be like? The world's all, this, this is all right. Land on the beach, right? The world is all right. Like, what does it look like for you? And the second one, is what does it look like when it's not? What do you do? So there are two questions that come from this. Question number one, and I want you to think about this. Question number one is who has the right to tell you what to do? Who has the right to tell you what to do? Because whatever you think this is what you're gonna be pursuing and somewhere in there, you have to begin thinking about this idea of authority or maybe a better word for it is rule. What is your sort of rule of life? What authority do you answer to? This is the great thing about coming to college, right? There is none. These are serious questions because if you don't know this, you are likely to chase all sorts of things that are gonna cause you to end up in places that you would swear today you would never be. And you know this is true. Who has the right to govern your attitudes and your actions and your beliefs. Number two, second question is, what do you do when things aren't as they should be? What do you do when things aren't as they should be, when things are wrong? Whether it's in your own head and heart, in the relationships that are around you or in the world in which we live. If you were broken or hurt or harmed 
or shamed or ashamed. If you feel like you have to hide or conceal or withhold things, if you can't trust anybody or you won't trust anybody, if you're angry or you're frustrated, right? if something isn't like it should be, whether it's within your own head and heart or home or whatever it is, what do you do about what isn't working? And you're like, why in the world would you be asking these questions? Because these two questions actually frame how you will likely spend your life. What you will be inclined towards, what you will chase after. So what we believe as that the authority, the rule that we live under is what we could call or sum up as the kingdom of God. This rule of God's love, and I'm just gonna mark right here so that I don't forget it, but it's a rule of love is what it is. I don't have time to talk about that much more than that today. But it's what governs. When we believe that in this kingdom, it has a king and that king is Jesus and all of our lives are to be submitted in allegiance to him. That is our authority. That's what we look to. That's who we look to, to say, Lord, how do you want for us to be. And we're very clear about that. We're not, we're very clear about that. What we are asking as you become a part of what's happening here is we want to help you learn what it looks like to live under the rule of his love and with him as Lord, with him as king, with him as ruler, with him having authority in your life to tell you what to do. Make sense? The second one gives us a bigger vision because what happens to a lot of us, we see what's wrong, we just think it's a big problem to be fixed. And what the kingdom does is it introduces us to another term. And this is the idea of redemption. This is why you don't have to run or hide or be afraid of what you were ashamed of. You don't have to pull away from things that you wish hadn't happened to you or wish you hadn't done or all those other things because God and what the gospel is about, that he takes what the enemy intended to undermine and destroy and he causes it to become something useful and beautiful. And it doesn't work like a jigsaw puzzle. When something devastating happens, you don't go, oh, in five years, I'll understand how this piece fits precisely into this puzzle that I have. What you'll find is that the puzzle box you're looking at will completely change. It's redemption. And what redemption requires, like redemption is a weird thing. And what I believe, and this is what I think the whole Bible is about, is the story of God's pursuit, his love for us, and his promise to redeem all things, to return everything to the way he's intended it to be. You were made by God and made for God, and he is not stopping until he pulls that, you know, from us, out of us. He causes it to be, so that's what he wants to do. We want our lives to be lived in that way. That's what we're talking about. And this is perhaps different than the way some people are used to hearing us talk about the gospel. But I think what's happened is we, we can't just fix or solve all the problems. In fact, that won't work. You'll just obsess and stress over everything that's wrong and you'll end up in these terrible patterns of frustration and anger and ultimately cynicism. Any cynical people in here? Are you sitting next to a cynical person today? I'm just kidding, don't raise your hand or point at them. In a world that is broken, when things aren't like they should be, we need a vision, a picture that compels us to get up and do something differently. And this is what I found over the course. We need a vision for the gospel. We need a vision for what God wants to do that is compelling enough for the sacrifice that will be required. I want to say this one more time. You and I need a vision, a picture of what God longs to do in this world that is compelling enough for the sacrifice that will be required for you, from you, and from me. So that's what we're, that's, that's what we're trying um, to do. I know a lot of you guys come into college 
And you've heard this, and everybody who is young once says the same thing. I'm still young, still very young, just not as young as I was. Um, but you, you hear that you're going to change the world. You get into college, study architecture. You're going to create developments and skyscrapers. They're going to change the world. Then you work in your 20s and you're, you're going to start, create a, start a church that changes the world. You're, you're going to start in your 20s and you get your 30s. Then by the time you get in your late 30s and early 40s, you realize that not only did you not change the world, but it's worse than it was when you started. Anybody felt that? Well, how'd you do? World changer? <laughs> not so good. And we keep saying this to the next generation. You're going to be world changers. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I'm not so sure the next generation has these idolistic years that we have. We've gotten to college. We at least thought the world would be different. I think a lot of guys coming to college are like, dude, this is a dumpster fire or whatever word you'd use for it. You're just wondering like, what are you gonna do like to not get burned by the whole thing? And so it's not even the same vision. So what are you going to do? You're going to protect yourself and make sure you carve out your space and your time and your way and make sure that no way, you know, and it's like everything just gets squeezed out in that mindset. And I think we need a bigger vision, a better vision than this, just this. God didn't command us to change the world. He called us to love the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should find the eternal kind of life. And so there's this, this thing that we have to do. And what I'm finding in sort of my experience and my part in this church is that this isn't a way for us to excuse us to take our hands off and do nothing, but rather it is a call and a test or a challenge, whether we will trust God enough, that we will trust that the love of God will actually bring about his heart for the world. Without me and you trying to, and listen, you know what's easier. It's a lot easier trying to change the world because then you can work hard. Well, they just don't care. They just don't get it. Those people and walk away. But if you have to love the world, then you have to do something fundamentally different. And this brings us into the idea of reach. Our goal, our charge as a church is to be a space or a place that runs counter to sort of the ways that we are accustomed to, the way that the world operates. We want to be distinct, countercultural, upside down, if you will. We are committed to bringing beauty and wholeness to the world as we learn to operate underneath his rule. And both of those are important. So here's Matthew 9, and then I'll get moving because I think they were all late, not me. So I'll be done just a little bit. So here's the thing. Jesus is teaching and he's healing. He's had some interactions with the Pharisees and people are gathering around him, all sorts of people. And if Jesus did anything, he kind of always sort of undermined the social order that was so carefully preserved by everything else that was happening at that time. Unclean people, lepers and blind people and people who didn't really belong and, and you know, uh, this, this adulterous woman and, and all these things that Jesus sort of just seems to be erasing the lines as people are gathered. And everybody has an opinion about those people and so, so do you and so do I. As so Jesus is standing among them and here's what he says, Matthew chapter nine, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And that was a normal metaphor in that day because there was a lot of sheep and a lot of shepherds. It wasn't like today we're like, oh yeah, we get that perfectly, we don't. He was like, there were people without a reason. They were, they, were, they were sort of left to their own devices. They were left chasing whatever they happened to think or feel or pursue. Do you know anybody like that? When you look at the world, what do you see? How do you see people? 
What's the emotion? Is it compassion or is it something else? Is it those people, right, are, and then you fill in the blank. And if we're gonna try to understand what it's like to live underneath and for his vision of redemption, We've got to get a view of what it looks like to see other people, to have compassion on them. They are, some, words, some, some versions say this bewilderment and helpless. They're bewildered. When we look at the world and you see people struggling with all these issues, it, it just breaks my heart, not because I'm going, they're wrong. It's because, oh my gosh, they're confused. There's such confusion and bewilderment around what's been intended and created and caused and what we're called to. And so how do, we, how do we step into this? What does this mean for us? He goes on in verse 37. Jesus says then to his disciples, this is the picture, right? They're, they're harassed, they're bewildered, they're helpless. And he saw, he had compassion. He calls us to see something different. And then he says, then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. And so then we have this natural thing. Well, this is how we reach people. We reach out to people right for the harvest. We save souls, bring them into our church, build our tenants, become a bigger church. Doesn't that sound fun to everybody? That was being sarcastic. The only people who care about big churches is usually other pastors, right? So I wanna be really like kind of candid and pull the curtain back a little bit because we've wrestled with all of these things. There's a lot that comes with all this that happens and you think a lot, all these thoughts go to me. You have to say, Lord, what do you do? How do we reach people and help them out with God? What is required of us? Well, a lot of people believe that reaching people is like saving souls. And don't get me wrong. I'm all for like soul saving. You, you, I want every person in here, in the sound of my voice, every person in our city to have a personal relationship with Christ not so they can go to heaven when they die, so they can find the life for which they have been intended and for which God promises to redeem. Do you see how different that sounds? A lot of people think that like, oh, you get people saved and that's like the goal. That's the goal. Not here. Your salvation, you coming to Christ is the starting line. It's the beginning point from which we become. We want to learn how to live under his rule and under his authority. And for that means we have to trust him with our lives. And that's that's the invitation for everybody to do. We want you to trust that. And we'll we'll talk more about that. But what I don't want you to think is that that, like reach is not about our influence or if you're like into influence, it's not about how many likes you have or how many followers you have or how much interaction you have. It's not about how many people in your seats. Reach measures our heart. Our reach measures what we are willing to care about. This is really important because for a lot of us, there are issues and things that people deal with in our city that we are completely isolated from. And we have the means and the money and the comfort to continue to isolate ourselves from any of those problems or issues in our city. And I know because that's what I did. I was laser focused on this, trying to do this. I thought that when I was like, uh, by the time I was 35 or 38, you know, I was building all my theological boxes and I would have all my boxes lined up and you just give me an issue and I'll reach into my theological box, my holster, boom, blow that issue out of the sky. You got another one, kaboom, blow that out of the sky. I was gonna be like a Bible gunslinger, man. Any issue you got, I got your answer. Get to be like 35, 38, get, you know everything you need to know and then you just execute on that for the next 30 years. That was my plan. You know what God did? He destroyed my boxes and all my little stuff went rolling out all over the place. Because he's trying to build something in us. To reach isn't about how big or how many. It's about what are we willing to care about? What are we willing to do about the things that we see in the world around us. So here's three things, this'll be the end. Three things, what it is for you, what it is for us, and then I'll pray for us. The three things are this. When I think about reach, what we mean 
is our willingness to include. For us, reach is our willingness to include. The way we reach is to include a person. Number two, I think about it being surrounded, not in some kind of stalkerish way that we're gonna come like find where you're living and put something, we're not talking about that. I'm talking about in a way that when, that you were enfolded so that you actually belong. I mean, I can tell you, man, if you're a parent of a college student, you're bringing your kid here, you want them to be surrounded. You want them to be surrounded by people and in some kind of place. You bring your teenagers here, you want them to be surrounded in a way. You know why? Because the third thing that reach does will shape you. Whatever you connect with, some of you college students, whatever you connect with in the next four days is likely gonna set the trajectory for the next four years. And for all of us, this is true. So the third component of this that I wanna highlight is, it compels me, is the beauty of our reach is what we become. Because here's the thing, not only does what you connect with shape you, what you connect with, you also shape. You cause us to be something different, to be something more. This is what I'm talking about. So what we need from you, this is your responsibility in this. Number one is the way in which you can belong. And I'm telling you, if you show up, or let me just say focused, the way you belong is to be willing to be a part, to be included, to step in. You just have to be willing to show up. Online's cool, right? Glad, podcasts are cool, but you gotta have someone in your grill, in your space, knowing who you are. And that's the second thing. The way for you to sort of experience this community, for you to be surrounded, is to be willing to participate. One of the things that we love about this is people walk into this room or our rooms all the time and they'll say this, Mike, if I came to your church, the walls would fall down. It's never happened. In fact, we had a lady, I'm gonna tell this story. We had a lady years ago. She had a rough, rough, rough um, past. And it wasn't even that far in the past. She shows up in our church, pulls in the parking lot out across the street in the woods. She gets out of her car and then she shuts her door. Then she opens her door, then she shuts her door. And she opens it again and she shuts it again and she begins to cry. And one of our parking lot volunteers sees her. And he walks over and says, ma'am, can I help you? She says, I can't go in there. He says, oh yes, you can. She said, no, I can't. He says, oh yes, you can. And he says, I'll walk with you. So he leaves his post in the parking lot, which is dangerous in and of itself, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and he brings her all the way in and he sits with her over here. The music starts and she just cries the whole time. If you knew her story, you would know this was unbelievable. She's crying and she leans over to him and she says, I can't believe you let people like me in here. And he looks back and he says, ma'am, we're all people like you. It's our willingness. It's our willingness to just avail ourselves to one another and for one another. So, what if you did this? Like, what if you were to do that today? What might the next four months or four years, what might your life look like if you were willing to sort of participate in this way? We take very seriously the fact that people trust us when they show up and give us their time and their attention, and they believe that we can be helpful. We take that very seriously and arrange everything to be so. But our aim in reaching people and helping them walk with God is, is not to build a big church, but rather to become a place that is shaped by God's love for us and our allegiance to Him, and to be known 
for the way we are willing to extend ourselves towards another. In a world that is increasingly divisive and divided, you know this is true. In a world that is increasingly chronically offended and offending. In a world that is violated and perpetually violating. Could there be a place that was different, distinct? Rick Schaefer, we wrote this. Uh, Rick's been working on this. He's one of our pastors. He wrote this. I'm just going to quote him. He says, the kingdom of God isn't a competing system. This is not one of two ways. It's the only enduring system by which we can experience the life for which we have been created. You will not find the kind of life you were made for apart from a relationship with him and apart from experiencing that within the community and the people that he has called and created us to be. Everything else is bewilderment and helplessness. So instead, what if we became a place and you experienced a place where you could connect and where you could be surrounded and you actually began to become the person that you have been created to be and in doing so, you caused this place to become the place God intends it to be. How cool would that be? And Leland and Anubin, I want to invite Danny and Don to come up and play online as they wrap up their time with those participating there. Hey, everybody online. Clay Everett here uh, outside of the Wilmington campus. And uh, I just wanted to personally come and say thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you're encouraged by Mike's message and the worship. I also want to tell you two things. And the first one is this, is that um, your participation online, it matters. The fact that you're tuning in right now, uh, maybe in your living room with family or maybe in a cafe somewhere, uh, it matters. It means that you're a part of who we are and what God is doing in our church. Uh, But number two, I want to tell you that you matter. Um, You matter to us. And because you matter, um, we do want to connect with you. Uh, And we want to find out ways, maybe new ways, that we can connect with you uh, who are watching online. And so um, the first way I want to encourage you in that today is if you're local to Wilmington, um, I'd love to invite you to the parking lot party uh, tonight, 6 p.m., in our parking lot here. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have dinner. We're going to have games. We're going to have music. We're going to have time of community. Um, We're praying it doesn't rain, um, but man, it would be amazing. And I know a lot of folks who have been watching online um, started watching online during the pandemic, and maybe it's just been hard to kind of get back. This could be a super easy way for you to kind of just be back here around the building. We'll be outside. Um, So I'd encourage you to that. The second way I would encourage you to connect with us is through our Connect card. Uh, The link to that will be on the screen. Uh, The Connect card is a way that you can let us know uh, what you need from us, right? Um, If we can help you connect into something, uh, if we can pray for you, you can use it. But here's the thing is, if you don't need anything else from us, would you still fill one out for me today or this week and just simply tell us like who you are, um, where you're watching from, who you're watching with, and maybe something you've been learning as you've engaged with us online. Um, You matter. Your participation online matters, and we just want to make sure that we're connecting with you the best way uh, that we can. And so uh, before we wrap our time together today, um, i just love to pray uh, for you and over you um, and close this out. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for the message. God, we thank you for the worship. God, we thank you for what you're doing uh, in our church and through our church. We thank you for the technology that is able to stream this out to people and to connect people in places Um, that they maybe otherwise couldn't um, participate in church like this. And so, God, um, we thank you for it. Uh, We also help, God, uh, we ask that you would help us to connect, to connect personally, relationally with each other, to care for each other um, as the church. God, we love you. Uh, We thank you for this day, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week.